When starting this project, I really didn't think it was going to take five months to complete. And if you're just learning this now, yes, it really did take five months to do all of it. First up was to try and get as much footage of the race as possible. Now, as this was 70 years ago, this wasn't actually really filmed for TV like you would see nowadays. I think the stat is back in 1950, only 1% of people who lived in the UK actually owned a TV. However, what they used to do was make newsreels which would play out to cinemas containing little snippet stories of what was going on around the world, so everyone could be informed and not have to read the newspaper. So I start here and look through the newsreel websites to find anything of the Silverstone Grand Prix, but then to complicate things, Newsreel websites sometimes get the naming conventions wrong, so it might be also known as the British Grand Prix, which has its own complications because that could be a completely different formula. But then it was also known as the Grand Prix de Europe, so then that means multiple searches, but then also having to fact check other newsreel websites, and it just complicates the whole thing. <laughs> I then extend the search by looking for more recognizable, well known drivers to see if they've had any film or documentaries made about them, which in itself might contain footage that I can use for the project. So let's use Fangio as an example. He's been featured in more than 20 documentaries about his life and the sport of Formula One. So I try to find any copies of the DVDs on eBay or digitally download them and extract any clips that feature him in that first race, so then I can slowly build out a library of selections of the entire thing. And you can have titles which could be from 30 minutes long upwards to two and a half hours long, and you've got to scrub through all of it to try and find any footage of that first race. It might only be that you find 10 seconds worth that you can use, but that could be gold dust, it could be a key overtake, it could be a retirement which is not shown in anywhere else. So once you've got all your footage, it's then time to consolidate and remove all the duplicate media that you've got. Now typically a load of films and documentaries will tend to use the same footage, however one will always be better quality than the other, and so basically whatever is the better looking quality version, get gets to stay and anything that's lower quality but that gets booted out. Time to then remaster the footage and make it look presentable and this isn't the process of restoring you know old film scans or anything like that this is me taking my copies from the archive news websites or from the DVDs or digital downloads and digitally making that look better so I'm remastering the footage not restoring it from the original old prints just as a just wanted to flag that. First is to scale up the footage to fit a high definition frame and it's not a simple scale up enlargement as the grainy footage will only look more grainy. I use a number of plugins to ensure the quality is kept consistent. Unsharp Mask, Red Giant Instant 4K, and Detail Preserving Upscale. Then it's processed through another plugin called Twixter, which is normally used for ultra slow motion frame blending, where it interpolates the frame without any weird artifacts. This is also where you can manipulate the footage to give 50 frames per second, which is what you would typically see when Formula One is on TV or when they upload race highlights. Now this method works really well for slow camera movements or even giving a realistic feel watching people walk around. However, programs and plugins like this struggle with camera parallax and fast moving subjects, such as a camera panning with an F1 car. You start to get weird artifacts and it just looks awful. So with this knowledge, it's then when I made the creative decision to begin the video in 50 frames a second, in color, and to try and make it look as close to the Formula One broadcast as possible. But then when we go to the race, all the colors go, on, go into black and white and the footage is then converted into 25 frames per second, so we don't get those weird artifacts. The graphics will still be in 50 frames per second, but just the footage will be back into 25. To help reduce some of the film grain and noise, it's then processed through a plugin called Neat Video, which helps reduce in some of that grainy noise and limits down some of those dirt and scratches. However, it doesn't work well with fast motion, again with fast panning shots of the cars. So for this, a lot of the big distraction scratches which couldn't be automatically removed are painted out frame by frame. Some scratches were left in as you still want it to feel like old footage, but it's more the distracting ones which would shift the viewer's focus away, so those are the ones I painted out. The final stage for making the footage look as best as possible is colour correction, and this was done in two processes because we had to do one in black and white and the other in colour. For the colour section, I first white balance each shot, basically anything I can identify as white. Next was to balance out the colours, so the grass for example is actually green not blue, or the Maserati is not being on the pink side but more red. Reference photos work amazing for this so you can accurately gauge what the real colour would be on the day it was filmed. Then because the sky contains a lot of scratches in grain, I create a sky replacement to easily remove the bad scratches and can easily saturate and brighten the look without affecting anything else in the frame. With the black and white footage, first it's a tint it all black and white so the colour levels are consistent with the footage, then adjust the highlights, whites, shadows and blacks until each shot is exposed correctly and looking the same. Now some of the footage will look worse than others and some of the footage you know has gone way too overexposed too much so that you can't really save it, but I mean, it's footage from 70 years ago. The fact we've got this is a miracle in itself. So I knew I wanted to start the video like a typical F1 race and so I looked on screen of what information they were showing about the territory and then trying to use that for my own piece. Which funnily enough, I actually had a few people commenting about these infographic stats and thinking it was a parody. Um, but real quick, the first fact here, which was that the accent changes notably every 25 miles. That's a real fact. That was even taken from last year's race. So that's just 
funny in itself. But then onto the Notable People one, I had to change two names because I wanted to keep it authentic to the 1950s of Notable People at that time. And the two people I had to swap out were John Lennon and Winston Churchill because at the time John Lennon would have only been 10 years old and Winston Churchill had only just finished being Prime Minister of like four or five years and he wouldn't be put into that section not like he's not now known for his legacy or anything like that. So I changed it to Beatrix Potter and Agatha Christie. Anyway, back onto the edit and now onto the harder stuff. This is where I'm gonna go through all the footage I have and pick out the key moments, which are, you know, overtakes, retirements, pit stops, notable people. So I can have massive selections and uh, categories together so I can quickly jump in, pull something out to put into the main edit. This is where a chunk of time is taken, but as you can see here, there are a lot of clips of cars being overtaken. But I hear ask, Matt, why didn't you include all these overtakes in the final video. Well, once I identified what the car numbers are, I then referenced it with the Formula One websites to give me a name. I then crossed that with where they started on the grid and looking at the lap charts to see where those two drivers would have crossed past. And so from all these clips you see, only two are actually overtakes captured on film. All the rest are clips of people just being lapped. So when it said that Alfa Romeo dominated that race, they weren't lying. Farina, who won the race, was six laps ahead of the person who finished in 11th. And that includes Farina's nine pit stops. That's six more than any other team. So it really sucks. I couldn't use these overtakes in the final video, but I didn't want to fake a narrative of drivers overtaking drivers when it wasn't the case. I wanted to be as authentic as possible and anyone could like figure out the two car numbers on screen, look at the lap charts and see that it was faked as well. It's just not really what I want to do. And also, I know I could include uh, someone being lapped in the race highlights, but typically you don't really do that um, because it's just not really exciting. So it sucks, but there you go. With the clips now organized, drivers identified, and the structure of the video now in place, it's now time for what everyone's probably been waiting for. It's now time to make the graphics. The first one I really wanted to tackle was a track map. Now these are full 3D animated sequences, and in all honesty, I'm not that good with 3D, but we can look at this shot and break down the components. Firstly, the only real 3D objects being used here are the trees, buildings, and grandstands. So to recreate the ground roads and track, I got hold of aerial photography and road maps from 1950 so that everything was authentic. I brought it into After Effects and singled the different sections and also traced them to be mask layers, then to convert them using a script into shape layers. Tinted then the same colour as the source material and then I've got my layers. Simply raise the roads in a 3D space to get the floating effect, add some red glow and that's the first bit sorted. I convert them from images into shape layers so then when I scale up the layer I won't lose any quality in the edges. For the 3D objects I got reference photos from motorsportimages.com and screenshots from the footage I already had and went onto Tinkercad which is a free online 3D maker and start building the objects. These don't need to be super detailed, but enough that it would cast shadows onto the ground, which is why I'm not using 2D objects. Download each one as a .obj file, then use Element 3D to place them in my scene. Add a grey plastic material along with ambient occlusion, scene lighting, and a 3D camera move. Then add a 3D shape layers for the red rings. Then create corner names using text and mask layers, parenting each number to the mask. Then parent the mask rotation with the camera move to rotate along with the camera move. Then boom, after a week of building and two days of exporting, the first big graphic was completed. Onto the opening information graphic. With this, I have a recorded copy of the Formula One broadcast and I work with one segment at a time. So typically, I start to work on the background first, animating a shape layer and going frame by frame to make the animation on point. Then onto the text details and other shape layer animations. I also build these in as few layers as possible. That way, if I ever need to make any changes, I can quickly do so without having to go through loads of pre-comps or messy workstations. All the fonts and logos are easily found online, but this cool looking outline text is something that was originally made by them and isn't available online. Online. So I literally had to take references used from the F1 game where it's used for their branding and create a custom one so it would read 1950. The racing tower is taking a pre-built version I've made and adding each driver to each position. And the abbreviations are taken from the first three letters of their last name but also where I link the team's color to the driver, which is usually taken from their team delivery color. It then goes into two weeks of animating and a lot of fact checking. It's not a simple process of just taking a lap chart and animating it. It's trying to figure out where people's positions are with the footage that you've got and working out where on the lap chart it is. So for example, on screen, I had at one moment on one corner, uh, in third position was Farina, uh, Fangio was in second position and Fagioli was in first. Through lap charts and working it out, I determined that it was actually on lap 36. Um, I don't think I actually use this in the end, but that's sort of the process I'm having to do. And then from there, start to make towers, and for here, this is our gains and losses for lap 15. All the different drivers of where they gained and lost positions from the starting grid, and then working out the math from that. 
I also wanted to bring in a new graphic which I hadn't done before, which was looking back at the race start because I noticed that the driver Kanban 2 had a really poor start. So again, looking at the reference, I then built out a lower third graphic and luckily I had a photo of the driver looking towards camera. I then colorized the image and then motion tracked his car using animated shape layers. Once done, we are then onto the final process of the video, which is getting the commentary added. And the reason why it's at the very end of the process is because I wanted to make the commentator's job as easy as possible, having all the graphics completed 100% accurate, as well as also me sending across any data sheets that they need to help with their voicing. And for the folk asking how I got the amazing Alex Jakes to be involved, to explain this better, I would suggest watching Colin Levy's video of how to get a world famous actor in your short film, just as it's sort of the same way I approach this, but it's also really good practice. And honestly, that's about it. You know, make a thumbnail, just triple check all your exports, make sure there's no weird audio glitches and no weird uh, graphics glitches or anything. And once you're all done, upload it post it. <laughs> and for the people who are still watching, just for the record, I got a load of messages saying that Formula One stole my idea of doing a graphics video because um, basically they uploaded to their YouTube channel of uh, the graphics packages going through the years on last year's uh, Silverstone Grand Prix. And so am I angry about it? Not at all. Why am I not angry about it? Well, I made it for them. <laughs> I've got a great relationship with the guys over at Formula One. They reached out and I was more than happy to help them out with this. So um, I'm glad I got to do two videos rather than one. So if you want to watch that video, you can do so by clicking over there as well. But that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed learning about the whole process it took for me to build this thing. So if you did enjoy this video, make sure to leave a like down below. And if you want to see future videos, then make sure to click subscribe. Just a reminder, I stream every Tuesday on the YouTube channel at 8 p.m. But thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.